Having taken their places in the Royal Box, we have the Prime Minister of the Netherlands there and then talking to them on the left-hand side, we have Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany. And we have the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Xavier Bettel, and the Canadian Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, chatting as well just before the event gets underway. We are all awaiting the arrival of the Guard of Honour, which will make its way into this arena very shortly. And that will signal that the event is about to get underway formally once Her Majesty the Queen has taken her place in the Royal Box. Prime Minister has arrived along with uh, President Trump and the First Lady Melania and President Macron there standing next to Theresa May in the front row of the Royal Box. President Trump who will be taking part in this event himself. Speaking on behalf of those thousands of US servicemen who took part on D-Day itself. So the Guard of Honor will take its place very shortly and that will signal the arrival of Her Majesty the Queen and uh, the Prince of Wales as well. And uh, the Guard of Honour now on its way. Royal Navy! John! Royal Air Force! No! Oh! Welsh Guard! Oh! Oh! Royal Navy! Long! Oh! Royal Air Force! So the Guard of Honour is on its way, marching through the audience, through the aisles and on to the main stage to signal the formal start of this commemorative event for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. 56 representatives of the Maritime Warfare School, some from HMS Collingwood, some from HMS Raleigh. Then we have the Queen's Colour Squadron, Royal Air Force. 56 of them, and there we have the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards as well in their scarlet tunics. So a combination of 56 representatives of each. The Maritime Warfare School making their way. Some of them finished their training last Friday, by the way, so what an event for them to be taking part in. And uh, the contingent also includes several divers from the Fleet Diving School in Portsmouth. There we have the Queen's Colour Squadron and the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards. Captain of the Honour Guard today is Major Chris Davis of the Welsh Guards. We spoke to them as they were preparing in the past couple of days and their immense pride at taking part uh, was plain for all to see. So the Guard of Honour now taking place. Watched with interest by uh, the President and the First Lady.
Enemy, come forward! Still! Stand still! The front rank of the right half division! Stand still! The front rank of the left half division! Last man, Welsh Guards, dressed back. Still! Stand still! The rear rank of the right half division! Okay, 12th man, Welsh Guards, dressed back. More yet! Still! Still! Stand still! The rear rank of the left half division! Galawala! Aiza! Foot! Very clear words of command, to say the least, from Major Chris Davis of the Welsh Guards, who's uh, commanding not just the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards today, but in fact is captain of the entire Honour Guard, so it's a great honour for him. Um, so the Guard of Honour now in place here in, uh, in South Sea for this commemorative event, and we're now awaiting the arrival of the Prince of Wales and Her Majesty the Queen.
ही जाए ओके ठीक जाए DJ, wow. I was the second one on the beach, second one off the off the craft. That morning, they they said, "We're we going to give you live ammunition, and this is the real thing." And that's the first we knew we were you know, in action. I thought, oh my God, uh, I was never brought up to this, go killing people. There were so many cases that uh, I could have lost my life. Thinking back now, I don't know how I survived it. Well, we all had a part to play. I wasn't nervous apprehensive like everybody else was. D-Day was all kept secret and hush-hush. I was on HMS Bologna. She was a light aircraft cruiser built to bring down aircraft. We had no idea we were at Omaha. You could see things were going, moving around, and puffs of smoke, etc. But at the time, we had no idea it was as vicious as it was. It's, it's the thing that happens only once in a lifetime and makes you proud of it, taking part. We'd never jumped in combat before, and so it was a new experience. I remember the anxiety mostly. What's going to happen when we get on the ground? We'd come out of the cloud effect, and the moon came out a little bit, and the ac -ac started coming up at us. Some of the other guys said, hell, you could get killed up here. And the other guy says, uh, yeah, let's get out of this plane. We did what we had to do. We jumped in there, and I don't regret it at all. In fact, I'm glad I did it. Went from a boy to a man that night. Your Majesty, Royal Highness, and distinguished guests. 75 years ago today, hundreds of thousands of men set out on a journey, a journey all the more remarkable as it held no promise of return. From across the globe, soldiers, sailors, and airmen united, bound together by a common goal to reach Normandy. Today, these veterans represent those countless fathers, husbands, brothers, and sons who departed these shores 
not knowing whether they would ever see home again. On the 5th of June, 1944, the view here on South Sea Common was very different. This was not green and open land, but a sea of uniforms, an ocean of men. Together, they waited to cross the channel. 75 years later, we are honored to be joined by over 300 veterans of Operation Overlord. They bravely risked their lives for our today. For the veterans, present arms. And to them, we show our profound appreciation. It seemed an impossible task. An invading army had not successfully crossed the English Channel in over 250 years. To triumph, the Allies would require the greatest amphibious force ever seen. And so they came together. Today, decades on, we stand unified again with leaders from Australia, Belgium, Canada, the Czech Republic, Denmark, France, Greece, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, Slovakia, and the United States of America. We also stand side by side with the Chancellor of Germany, our nations long since reconciled and united in pursuit of world peace. A world peace that seemed terrifyingly out of reach just three quarters of a century ago. Good order will form three ranks. Form three ranks. Outward. Turn. Turn up. Turn. Turn. While the trauma of conflict still haunted a generation, a second world war began. Germany has invaded Poland and has bombed many towns. General mobilization has been ordered in Britain and France. But Germany, on the offensive, pressed through Europe. The German army invaded Holland and Belgium early this morning by land and by landings from parachutes. The armies of the Low Countries are resisting. Finally, on May the 10th, 1940, France, too, was attacked. Driven back to the port of Dunkirk, the British expeditionary force was overwhelmed and exhausted. Adolf Hitler had achieved his objective, control of mainland Europe. An extract from the memoir of Violette Le Duc, a civilian living in Paris as France fell. 
The enemy were advancing. They were gaining ground. Everyone else had cleared out. I was scared. I begged my mother to leave. We finally left at half past five one morning through the silent streets, the silent buildings. It was heartbreaking to see the bricks, the stones, the pavements, the churches, the benches, the squares, the bus stops, the curtains and the shutters, all abandoned to their solitude. Everything induced such pity. Paris was a human ruin. We followed the procession, streaming along both sides of the road. Mothers nursing their infants in the ditches. Young girls tottering along in heels. Soldiers singing as they were driven past in trucks. And one man making a solitary way with a mattress on his back. Suburbanites hung outside their windows to watch us pass. Our misfortune had become a funeral cortege. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. The United Kingdom became the center of the free world as ex exiled European governments took refuge here. From crisis, unity grew. But concerns for the Soviet Union were mounting. Combat on the Eastern Front was ferocious and Stalin's Red Army vulnerable. So a raid was planned on the German occupied port of Dieppe, the Canadians were to provide the majority of the personnel, and they would bear the deepest wound. As for the 6,000 men who fought, 4,000 were captured, wounded, or killed. The Prime Minister of Canada. Durant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, mon grand-père, James Sinclair, a combattu aux côtés de plus d'un demi-million de Canadiens courageux. Peu de gens ont servi leur pays de façon plus héroïque que ceux qui se sont battus à Dieppe. This is the citation of Lieutenant Colonel Cecil Merritt, who was awarded the Victoria Cross, the first Canadian to be awarded a Victoria Cross in World War II. From the point of landing, his unit's advance had to be made across a bridge in Pourville, which was swept by very heavy machine gun, mortar, and artillery fire. The first parties were mostly destroyed and the bridge thickly covered by their bodies. A daring lead was required. Waving his helmet, Lieutenant Colonel Merritt rushed forward shouting, come on over, there's nothing to worry about here. He thus personally led the survivors of at least four parties in turn across the bridge. Quickly organizing these, he led them forward. And when held by enemy pillboxes, he again headed rushes which succeeded in clearing them. After several of his runners became casualties, he himself kept contact with his different positions. Although twice wounded, Lieutenant Colonel Merritt continued to direct the unit's operations with great vigor and determination. He then coolly gave orders for the departure and announced his intention to hold off and get even with 
the enemy. When last seen, he was collecting Bren and Tommy guns and preparing a defensive position which successfully covered the withdrawal from the beach. Lieutenant Colonel Merritt is now reported to be a prisoner of war. Lessons were learned from the raid on Dieppe. Lord Louis Mountbatten claimed that for every soldier who died there, 10 were saved on D-Day. In the wake of Dieppe, the vast and sandy beaches of northern France were now the target for landing. One thing had become startlingly clear. To triumph all nations, all services, everyone must work together. In 1943, the Allied leaders met for the first time in Tehran. It was a summit of great significance, not only because the timing of D-Day was discussed, but also together they pledged to form a common policy of world peace. We express our determination that our nations shall work together in war and in the peace that will follow. And as to peace, we are sure that our Concord will win an enduring peace. We recognize fully the supreme responsibility resting upon us and all the United Nations to make a peace which will command the goodwill of the overwhelming mass of the peoples of the world and banish the scourge and terror of war for many generations. We have surveyed the problems of the future. We shall seek the cooperation and active participation of all nations, large and small, whose peoples in heart and mind are dedicated, as are our own peoples, to the elimination of tyranny and slavery, oppression and intolerance. We will welcome them as they may choose to come into a world family of democratic nations. We look with confidence to the day when all peoples of the world may live free lives, untouched by tyranny, and according to their varying desires and their own consciences. We came here with hope and determination we leave here, friends, in fact, in spirit, and in purpose.
In 1942, support and resources arrived on a staggering scale when from across the pond, the American contingent rallied. Over one and a half million men left the USA bidding farewell to life as they knew it, to coffee, to baseball, and to loved ones. With photographs folded in pockets, they traveled halfway across the world to join the pursuit of freedom. During a radio message, President Roosevelt led the nation in a prayer that will be forever remembered by the American people. The President of the United States. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. They will need thy blessings, for the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteous of our cause, our sons will triumph. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, the heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And, O Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in thee faith in our sons, faith in each other, and faith in our united crusade. Thy will be done, almighty God. Amen. A letter home from Private Arthur Pranger, 6th May, 1944. Dear Mom, well, here I am somewhere in England. We we're putting private homes in this town. The people will do anything to help you and make you comfortable. They won't have us clean up the room in the morning. They clean it for us. They sure go for tea in a big way. Every time I turn around, someone's always trying to shove a cup of tea in my fist. People even stop us on the street and invite us for tea and cake. The kids are always asking for chewing gum and candy. Everything is rationed. There's hardly any automobiles, and everybody rides a bicycle. They told us all about the bombings, and this place has been hit quite a few times. There haven't been any bombings for quite a while. They watch the movies all Americans watch, and they like Bing Crosby, too. They hardly have any heat or hot water, it sure gets cold here. They sure are surprised when they hear everything we get in the States. Well, that's all for now, but I'll write again soon. Your son, Private Arthur Pranger, 86th Chemical Mortar Battalion. Thanks, 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 
With the beaches of Normandy decided upon, the largest military intelligence, sabotage and deception operation in history began. The aim, to discover everything about what the invasion force would encounter whilst concealing the intended target. Out of the several hundred agents working behind enemy lines, many were women and recruited from my corps, the first aid nursing yeomanry. The enemy simply did not expect Allied spies to be women. After meticulous selection, these brave young women were dropped into Europe, where they began their perilous work. We stand here today, honored to pay tribute to the incredible men and women of the Intelligence Services and Special Operations Executive. One of these remarkable agents was Yvonne Cormeau, who against all odds survived 13 months and two days in occupied France. This is her story. After my husband was killed in November 1940, I joined the WAF. I told them I spoke German, Spanish and French. This filtered through the ministry, and suddenly I was being interrogated to assess my suitability for the SOE. I joined in, in 1943. After extensive training, I was parachuted into France. We were greeted by five men from the resistance. Over the next year, I hid in villages and was shot at by the Gestapo. But that was nothing compared to this, our closest run-in. While traveling south, we came face to face with a German personnel carrier. They told us to get out of the car and put us in a ditch. Two soldiers held pistols to our backs. The soldier in charge was on his radio, asking us what he should do with us. My perspiration was coming down. The flies were sticking to it. I couldn't move or they would have shot us. Then the crackle came again on his radio. He told us to get in the car. But before we could leave, he stopped us, asking what was in the case on our back seat. It was my radio set. I opened it and said a German word that meant both radio and x-ray. 
Luckily, I was carrying a district nurse card, so he assumed it was the latter and let us go. We got out very fast. In this war of loud and overwhelming might, the quietness of collective knowledge was key. The intelligence services, together with resistance movements from across Europe, carried the weight of this task. Working closely, they gathered valuable information for the Allies. But it was the intelligence and skillfully managed sabotage missions of the French resistance that proved absolutely critical to D-Day's success. This is the last letter of a young resistance fighter, Henri Ferté, executed at just 16 years old on the 25th of September, 1943. The President of the French Republic, Let me first thank you sincerely on behalf of my nation. Chers parents, ma lettre va vous causer une grande peine. Mais je vous ai vu si plein de courage que je n'en doute pas vous voudrez bien encore le garder, ne serait-ce que par amour pour moi. Je meurs pour ma patrie. Je veux une France libre et des Français heureux. Non pas une France orgueilleuse et première nation du monde, mais une France travailleuse, laborieuse et honnête. Que les Français soient heureux. Voilà l'essentiel. Dans la vie, il faut savoir cueillir le bonheur. Pour moi, ne vous faites pas de soucis. Je garde mon courage et ma belle humeur jusqu'au bout. Et je chanterai sans brémeuse parce que c'est toi, ma chère petite maman, qui me l'a appris. Les soldats viennent me chercher. Je hâte le pas. Mon écriture est peut-être tremblée, mais c'est parce que j'ai un petit crayon. Je n'ai pas peur de la mort. J'ai la conscience tellement tranquille. Adieu. La mort m'appelle. Je ne veux ni bandeau, ni être attaché. Je vous embrasse tous. C'est dur quand même de mourir. Mille baisers. Vive la France.
Technology has always played a decisive part in warfare, but never before has so much technical and engineering energy been applied to a single day's fighting. The marvellous range of technology that helped to make the landing succeed and ensured that over two million men and half a million vehicles could be landed in the ensuing months included amphibious and mine-clearing tanks, Mulberry harbours, gliders, undersea pipelines, self-heating soup cans, air-portable motorbikes, all reflected British ingenuity and innovation at its best. A host of civilian scientists, mathematicians and engineers saw their ideas transformed into reality by the very best of British industry, working round the clock to deliver what was needed for the front line. Above all, D-Day was a truly national and multinational endeavour. Air supremacy means power, power to strike at the enemy where he is most vulnerable. And the basis of that power is simply production. And the British workers gave of their best. Winston Churchill promised much of our warplane output 
And that promise was kept to the letter. British factories are turning out now some of the heaviest bombers in the world, as the Germans know to their cost. Britain has taken the offensive. The long struggle for air supremacy is bearing fruit. We would build great harbour units in England, tow them across the sea, and set them down during the battle off the Normandy coast. Over 30,000 men were at work on strange, monstrous structures of which they could not be told the purpose. Half a million tons of concrete alone went to the building of these manors. These are the women, typical of thousands, who make munitions and keep their family life going at the same time. These machines finish the inside of the gun barrel. Shells are fussy things, they're like a good sandal. By the end of the ship, the stuff piles up. Flow is what we want. Raw material into components, components to sub-assemblies, sub-assemblies to the finished gun. Civilian Alan Atkins memories of the build-up of soldiers and equipment on the south coast, June 1944. My father was very excited. It's on, Rose, he kept saying. We're going for sure. This is history in the making. At the top of our road, we could hear a roaring sound. There were lots of people going the same way as us, many carrying little flags on sticks. Everybody was talking. Some spoke to my mother. Good news, missus, we're going. Yes, my mother would reply. It would seem so. I hope it's not just an exercise, though. Not this time, missus, another man said. The docks are full of boats, three and four deep at each berth. It's on for sure. The roaring was louder now. We realized what was causing it. As two lines of trucks thundered past us down to the docks. Some carried piles of boxes and crates, but most had soldiers standing up and smiling and waving at us. A letter from Captain N. W. G. Skinner. Royal Army Service Corps to his wife, written two days before setting sail for Normandy. 3rd of June, 1944. My darling, this is a very difficult letter for me to write. As you know, something may happen at any moment, and I cannot tell when you will receive this. I had hoped to be able to see you during last weekend, but it was impossible to get away, and all the things I intended to say must be written. I'm sure that anyone with imagination must dislike the thought of what's coming, but my fears will be more of being afraid than of what can happen to me. You and I have had some lovely years, which now seem to have passed at lightning speed. My thoughts at this moment, in this lovely Saturday afternoon, are with you all now. I can imagine you in the garden, having tea with Janie and Anne, getting ready to put them to bed. Although I would give anything to be back with you. I have not yet had any wish at all to back down from the job we have to do. There is so much that I would like to be able to tell you, nearly all of which you've heard many, many times. 
but just to say that I mean it even more today. I'm sure that I will be with you again soon and for good. Please give my fondest love to my Anne and my Jamie. God bless and keep you all safe for me. Dear Mrs. Skinner, it is with the utmost difficulty that I write this letter to offer you my most profound sympathies on the untimely death of your husband. All the time he had been under my command, he had done a grand job of work. Should there be any matters of which I could be of assistance, please do not hesitate to let me know. Yours very sincerely. Seventy-five years ago today, just a stone's throw away from here, General Eisenhower was in Southwick House. While tactics were in order and strategy was managed, there was one factor he simply could not command, the British weather. For a successful invasion to take place, calm weather conditions were essential. Despite diligent attention and meticulous planning, this operation now relied entirely on the unreliable. In these final stages, there was one man whose guiding hand remained steady. General Eisenhower's chief meteorological officer, Group Captain James Stagg. Pressure, the West End play written by David Haig, brings this remarkable and significant story to life. Gentlemen, one feature has changed substantially since the last chart. The long northeastward extension of the Azores anticyclone has withdrawn from Ireland and been forced south into the Bay of Biscay. We can no longer rely on this ridge of high pressure to offer any protection whatsoever to the English Channel on the 5th of June. Obviously, I haven't conferred with Colonel Crick yet, but I imagine he would agree. No, I would not. On what grounds? If you look at the weather charts of June 1923, you will see a similar temporary weakening of the high pressure over the Azores. Within 24 hours, it had reinforced itself and pushed northeastward again. Not so in 1907, not so in 1915. You pick 1923 because it suits your purpose. Are you implying, Dr. Stagg, that Colonel Craig is distorting the truth? Not distorting the truth, no. I trust the Colonel's integrity totally. I trust his record, which is second to none. Gentlemen, many of my men owe their lives to the accuracy of Colonel Crick's forecast. This chart is exactly what I expected. I maintain my prediction of calm, fine weather on Monday. Your prediction, Dr. Stack. For seven winds, low cloud, waves 10 to 12 feet, possibly 15 feet. Are you aware of the consequences of postponement? even for as little as 24 hours. I think I am, sir. Essentially, I would be canceling D-Day. The only other alternative this year, June 19th, is fraught with danger. No full moon. And more importantly, between the 5th and the 19th, we would need to disembark 300,000 men who have been fully briefed. With the best will in the world, preserving the secrecy of D-Day would be impossible. Thousands of ships returning to harbor in stormy seas. Corrosive uncertainty. Demoralized men cooped up in their cabins like animals on their way to the slaughterhouse. Any holdup could be lethal. We cannot delay unless we absolutely have to. Sir. Sir. I can't offer you certainty. I've always said that long-term forecasting is a gamble. What I do offer is 25 years of observing British weather. 
and despite every risk you've identified, instinct and experience tell me the landing should be postponed. I'm now confident that the Storm L6 will pass through the English Channel on Monday morning. It is a storm of unprecedented malignity for the time of year. I anticipate storm force winds throughout the day. Okay. Okay. Assuming for a moment we accept Dr. Stagg's prognosis. Four, seven winds, low cloud, considerable swell. What are the worst conditions we can tolerate, Bertie? Anything above force five and the landing craft will capsize. Waves of four to six feet are dangerous but tolerable. Anything over six feet, impossible. If Stagg's forecast is correct, the subsequent swell could exceed nine feet. Now, my other concern is deterioration in the weather on Tuesday and Wednesday, which would leave a quarter of a million men stranded on the beaches with no possibility of landing more troops and equipment as backup. Trevor. How complete will cloud cover be on Monday morning? Ten tenths, zero to 500 feet. Fog. Extremely likely. Absolutely impossible. My bombers won't be able to see their target, so no guaranteed cover for the landings. Inaccurate bombing will put the lives of thousands of French civilians at risk. Under no circumstances could I support invasion in the conditions described by Dr. Stagg. It would be a catastrophe. Tui! Everything Trafford says is true. And if base is as low as zero, you're going to get mid-air collisions. Lose a lot of aircraft, lose a lot of lives. But if we get ashore, the war is over. Might take a while, but it's over. Could argue that any sacrifice on Monday is justifiable. Thank you, gentlemen. I am inclined to believe, to put my faith in Dr. Stagg's forecast, in which case I have no choice but to postpone Overlord for at least 24 hours. Are there any Decennian votes, Bertie? No. Trevor? No. Spats? No. So be it. D-Day will be postponed. The memories of a Royal Naval Electrician, R.G. Watts, as he left Southampton for Normandy in June 1944. The troop landing craft was packed to full capacity. 
There was no cover for the army, just standing or sitting, exposed to the elements. The weather conditions were atrocious. A force eight gale was blowing. The craft, built with a flat bottom hull, was tossed about in all directions. By this time, I estimate that 90% of the soldiers were extremely seasick, just holding on to anything to hand. All that training for fitness. But now old mother nature was laughing at us. The stench of diesel oil and vomit all over the deck became a situation one would not forget in a hurry. Experiencing these conditions right through a very dark night, being tossed about in such a rough sea, caused us to reach a state of exhaustion. Our eyes felt as heavy as lead. You're about to hear an extract of the memoir of Private Franz Gockel of the 352nd Division German Army as he guarded the Normandy coast. During the evening hours on the 5th of June, like so often before, a debate raged in the bunker over the possibility of invasion. The opinions were varied, and with heated argument, one group was convinced that the English or Americans would never attempt to land there. I stood at my sentry post. Like so often before, the duty seemed to last an eternity. Finally, I was relieved, and I trotted to the bunker to try to get a few hours rest before I had to be awakened again. At the bunker stood a comrade who had also just been relieved at his post and was reporting to the sergeant of the watch over the radio. I said to him, I hope that we don't have one of those damned exercise alerts tonight, as we so often had in the past. And I disappeared into the bunker, deep under the ground. Quickly, the overcoat and boots were pulled off, and I dove into my bunk, relieved. You want to see me? A development sort out of the ordinary. Yeah. How long to tug the invasion force around again? Have you seen the goddamn weather? The storm east of Newfoundland is slowing down, sir, enough to provide a window, a gap, a period of calmer weather on the morning of Tuesday the 6th. Certain? Never certain. 23 landing craft capsized today, returning to port, men drowned. Soldiers trapped in their cabins, like animals, seasick, terrified. Yes, sir. Is Tuesday possible, sir? Possible, but extremely risky. Information I'm receiving points to a gap long enough to launch the invasion on Tuesday morning. Proof. The next chart, five hours. Too late! I need to issue orders within an hour. Are you... Telling me to go. A calmer spell of weather will arrive tomorrow night, sir. If you look at the chart. I don't want to look at the chart. I want you to look me in the eye. Tell me the weather's going to be good on Tuesday morning. Good enough, sir. Then I'm prepared to take the risk. I'm very confident, sir. I've seen this happen before, very confident. You know, there's a hurricane blowing out there. Well, it's not a hurricane. It's a hell of a storm! Irving? Tuesday morning may be possible, sir. Christ on the mountain. My weathermen agree. Good enough for the bombers? Yes, sir. Cloud cover? Very little, one to two tenths. Clear skies? Yes, sir. Wind speed? Three, occasionally four. Okay, goddamn, okay. Let's go. Good work, gentlemen. Thank you. General Eisenhower's order of the day. Delivered June 5th, 1944. 
soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck. And let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. When the first special service commandos arrived in Normandy on D-Day, the commander of the brigade, Lord Lovett, brought his personal paper with him, Bill Millen. This is his account. I jumped off the ramp as quickly as possible, holding the bagpipes above my head, and I landed in the water up to my waist. I felt myself falling backwards due to the weight of my rucksack. Luckily, someone pulled me upright and I struggled through the water. There was a lot of noise. The sound of automatic fire and what appeared to be mortar shells bursting on the beach away to the right. I placed a bagpipe on my shoulder, blew them up, and started to play high and laddie as I waded the few yards to the beach. Lovett turned his head towards me when he heard the pipes. He looked at me for a moment, appeared to smile, then continued on his way. Memories of Private Tom Duncan of the Gordon Highlanders Regiment as he landed on Sword Beach. I shall never forget hearing the skirrer of Bill Millen's pipes. It is hard to describe how it had. It gave us a great lift and increased our determination. As well as the pride we felt, it reminded us of home and why we were there fighting for our lives and those of our loved ones. Today is 99 year old Portsmouth D Day veteran John Jenkins, MBE.
I was 12 years old when I landed on Gold Beach. Sorry, 23 years old. <laughs> I put my age back a bit. I was terrified. I think everyone was. You don't show it, but it's there. I look back on it as a big part of my life. It changed me in a way. But I was just a small part in a very big machine. I'm honoured to be stood here today in front of so many other veterans. You never forget your comrades because we're all in it together. It's right that the courage and sacrifice of so many is being honoured 75 years on. We must never forget. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, when I attended the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the D-Day landings, some thought it might be the last such event. But the wartime generation, my generation, is resilient and I'm delighted to be with you in Portsmouth today. 75 years ago, hundreds of thousands of young soldiers, sailors, and airmen left these shores in the cause of freedom. In a broadcast to the nation at that time, my father, King George VI, said, what is demanded from us all is something more than courage and endurance. We need a revival of spirit, a new unconquerable resolve. That is exactly what those brave men brought to the battle, as the fate of the world depended on their success. Many of them would never return, and the hero heroism, courage, and sacrifice of those who lost their lives will never be forgotten. It is with humility and pleasure on behalf of the entire country, indeed the whole free world, that I say to you all, thank you.
The applause for Sheridan Smith and right on cue we have the D-Day anniversary fly past uh, by the Royal Air Force. Eight elements and we've already had the iconic Spitfire and Hurricane and the, uh, the helicopter segment as well.